your life, your pen. Mr. Charlie Smith, that is his overall message, and it's an incredible one. Charlie Smith is more than a keynote speaker and a coach. Uh, this man is, is just you know a beautiful human at heart, and you'll see from our chat today how much he cares about truly developing humans. He went from a commercial real estate background to, uh, you know, the human space and really wanting to help individuals. And the reason being is because he got in such a place of, of go, 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 the hustle and grind of being a businessman and wanting to produce and realizing how much more there is to life. And so through Charlie's stories, you will see he takes us to the darkest places of, of where his beginnings were and how he now today truly brings his mess and has turned it into his message that he brings to you know high school kids, corporations for sales individuals to athletes and works on the mindset and everything in between to allow people to see what they're truly capable of and write the story of their life. Know that the power is within them to create their future and be the authors of their story. So please tune into this one. You will not regret it. I feel truly blessed and honored to have had the time with Charlie during this hour chat that we had. And I have no question in my mind that you'll feel the same way and walk away with so many gems of wisdom. So enjoy this episode with Charlie. And um, please, as always, like and subscribe if you enjoyed the episode. Send us comments, feedback, and uh, really look forward to you guys watching this one. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Conscious Creator Podcast. I am very honored and grateful today to have on uh, a new friend of mine for, uh, for about six months, I can say now. Uh, Charlie Smith. So big welcome, Charlie. Thanks, Mike. It's it's amazing to be here. It's amazing to see how this world can get connected through the mediums available to us today. You know, it's it's so remarkable. Like anything, how you use things is all how you what you get out of them. And this has been remarkable. Absolutely agree. And before I introduce you a little further, and um, I, I, you know, we dive into conversation. I want to begin this podcast and this this chat how we always do here, which is with three conscious breaths. So, for if you'd like to join me, I would love for you to just to ground us and be present in this conversation. And then for anybody listening that isn't driving, of course, please join us as well. But um, let's just close down our eyes for a moment, really settle into where we are. And we'll take three breaths together in three, two, one. Big in through the nose and release. Another one. Release. And one more. Release. All right. I feel a little more grounded. I don't know about you, but it always uh, does the trick for me. Oh, so good. Yeah, amazing. I, I wish they taught us how to breathe as we were growing up, you know? Oh, there's a, there's that, that's a long list of the things uh, I, yeah, wish, well I wish they taught us when we were younger. <laughs> Yes, yeah. that's a whole podcast on its own. Again, um, honored to have you here, brother. Uh, Charlie Smith is a, a keynote, keynote speaker, very inspirational individual, uh, a coach, and um, I'm sure many other things. But, uh, you know, we connected, and, and as anybody else I have on this podcast, it's just people who simply inspire me and people who are bringing uh, amazing messages to the world. And that's what I've seen in Charlie nonstop since we connected six months ago. And before I allow you to flow in, I want to just talk about how we did connect. And that that was um, on Instagram. And I'll tell you, uh, I, I believe Charlie had just, you know, sent a, a quick DM um, commenting on, on, you know, some of the pieces we were doing in the extremely conscious space. And, um, by us simply saying, you know, I live here, you live there, love your message, love your message. By the end of that interaction, he had asked for my physical address and um, he wanted to send me a, a small gift. And so it's uh, it's been amazing to connect, brother, because again, that was that was back in December. I had to look it up today. But uh, yeah, six or seven months in, here we are. Yeah, it's a, it's it's great. You know, the connection you can make, the energy that exists in the world is powerful and just 
through that intentional action of, of taking, being vulnerable, you know, just putting a message out and connecting with someone that shares your values and your principles and is in the world to help other people. And, and then, of course, you know, wanting to, to share that gift of, of your own personal pen with you was, was powerful for me. I love that's my that's my mission, you know. Totally. And it, it was amazing. I want to tell you, obviously, it, it fired me up when he said he was sending me something and I had no idea what it was. Charlie and I had just connected. I didn't even really know what his messages were. Um, and then I received this this little envelope um, with a pen in it that said, your life, your pen. And I had to pull the message today because it was wonderful. Uh, following that, you know, the the card said, an extremely conscious man should definitely own the pen to create the life he is intended to live. Here is yours. Keep writing an amazing story. So it was just so, so heartfelt and powerful and appreciated. And, you know, I can say I, I've never met someone with, you know, so little time to interact and then received a gift like that. And it was, it was amazing with that strong of a message. And so from then on, of course, I had to say, I got to connect, keep connected to this guy. Yeah, we, and we had, and we, and we had, <laughs> and, and we um, will. Yes. And I kept that card on my desk for a long time because it, it was, you know, just a, a little reminder as well. Uh, how, how the small gestures in life can go such a long way and, and how when we share our message, you know, we give others the permission to do the same and, and inspire. So um, I really appreciate that. And, and you know, it was, it was such, just such a cool gesture. And before I know you could talk about, you know, your life, your pen, I do, I would love to wind the clock back a little bit and just learn more about Charlie. <clears throat> because I find it's where a lot of people can truly connect um, and resonate with different pieces of, of what's your story, you know, before all this inspiration came, before you're the man that, that stands on stage today and, and has these motivational talks and gets these athletes fired up. Um, where did this begin? And, and, you know, go back as far as you like, but um, where, did this, where did this path start for you? Yeah, it, it, I so appreciate the question and, and because it started in darkness, you know, I think when we talk about being conscious and we talk about arriving at a conscious state, you know, for me, it, 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 it arose out of a very extreme sense of unconsciousness. And so, you know, my path is, is, is really born out of, out of darkness. I grew up in Scarborough, Maine, so about 3,500 miles from where I am now. And, and I grew up in a small town called Scarborough, about an hour outside of Portland in a, in a relatively lower middle class family. My dad was a college professor. My mom was a first grade school teacher. And so really, Mike, to the outside world, we look like every other kind of lower, you know, middle class family in Scarborough, Maine. And, and in fact, in 1970, we were on the cover of Catholic Digest magazine. Um, but, but like a lot of things in life, things were not as they appear. That wasn't the truth of my reality. And so I grew up at the being violently abused at the hands of my, my dad, who at the age of 19 had a 45 caliber pistol leveled at my head. My brother was home from the, the service at that time. He knocked him off of my chest and, and I was able to leave. And really at the age of 19, I left that town in Scarborough, Maine and, and put him and that life in my rearview mirror and went on to pursue what I thought would be, you know, arriving and achieving material success. And, and if I could deny what would hap what was happening to me, I could deny that it ever happened. And so my, my message to, to most today is what you don't deal with will deal with you. You know, that we all have whatever scars they are, you know, whatever whatever we've been through, it's part of us. And I'll say that I used to be embarrassed and ashamed of how I grew up. I used to be embarrassed and ashamed of what I went through until I realized that that young version of me made some incredibly powerful and empowering decisions to change his life. And I've, I've gained a whole new respect for that young man and what he went through today that I haven't always had. Incredible. Thanks for bringing us into that. That's that's powerful. And, and so many people... I'm sure it can resonate and go through that, right? We all, regardless of where we think we are today, we all have traumas, um, you know, and continue to today as we go through our lives. And I think you nailed it, right? It's so easy for us to get in the busy work. And when we do things that make us feel good to, to try to move past it and not actually dive in and, and work through it. And so I guess I'll ask that kind of, at what stage did you realize you know, you were still carrying these things um, that had happened to you, happened for you, but, uh, you know, in the next stage of your life that you knew you had to really dive deep on and, and deal with. 
Yes, we all. I think we all come to to an inflection point in our lives, a, a kind of a, a a decision and a choice has to be made. So, leading up to that, I I, I went to college. I graduated with an economics degree. I, I pursued a career in commercial real estate. You know, I started in the in the nineties. I moved myself all the way to California for work. And for me, it was you know, if I could just keep putting distance between me and Maine. You know, I mean, my end hap- my my darkness happened here in California. Who knows? Maybe I'd be in Hawaii if I didn't hit bottom, although Hawaii has a part of my story. Um, but I came out here pursuing material success. I came out here pursu- pursuing this commercial real estate career that I had developed a knack for. I had an ability to create some value, find distressed assets, buy them, fix them up. And, and that led to a development career. But what I was using to avoid dealing with the pain of my past was drugs and alcohol. I started drinking at the age of 12. And so for me, you know, material success, numbing my pain with drugs and alcohol al- allowed me to create this world that I thought would shield me from dealing with my past. And what happened is uh, about 2005, my mom experienced the same uh, situation that I was in at the age of 19. Her and my father had had, had another inter- interaction and, and he put a gun to, in her life and she left at the age at the at 43 years of marriage. And where she ended up was at my home in California. And I had created these false selves. I call my, I call them for lack of a better term. I, I, I left here, Calif- I left Connecticut and I came to California and I never even told anyone I grew up in Maine, you know, so I had created this false identity that I was attached to. And when my mom came into my house in 2005, all of my lies came to the surface, you know, my, my wife at the time was shocked that I had grown up the way that I did. My kids were learning things about me I'd never told them. The world was learning things about me that I had never told them, and it all became unbearable. So my drinking escalated, and in, in February of 2008, you know, I will say this to you. I could pass a lot of tests in February of 2008. I could pass the bank account test. I could pass the house test. I could pass the family test. I could pass the career test. But there was one test I was unable to pass look in the mirror test. And that's the, that's the, that's the, for a conscious man, you know, for somebody who's, who's elevating their consciousness to be at that level of unconsciousness where I couldn't even face the reality of who I was. I was at that point where I had to deal with what I hadn't been dealing with. And it was in February of 2008 that I put the drugs and alcohol down. I put the numbing agents down and decided to deal with the pain so I could get through the pain. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's incredible how you know we can try to run from things and we can try to press them down but the universe always speaks loudest right and uh or you know our internal systems fire up and 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 create that within us yeah and that's i think when when i when i talk about one of the things that that i'm really passionate about is the idea of self awareness you know and it's not it's not that, there, that that I was broken. It was that I just had the, the wrong lens on my past. You know, when I looked at it is, I looked at it through the lens of if somebody is treating this, me this way, there must be something wrong with me. That was the only narrative I could have. And so, you know, through that narrative and that filter, everything that I saw in my life was a reflection of there must be something wrong with me. And, 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 and if I could just pursue and accumulate and grab then I could prove that's not true, but there was never anything wrong with me. There might've been something very wrong with my, with my dad. And and he might've been through things, you know, that caused him to do what he did, but it sure didn't mean there was anything wrong with me. And that's why, you know, we'll get into, I'm sure a little, a little while, how I really got clarity around that was when I realized I'd just been giving him the pen. I'd just been giving him the pen to the story of my life since I was very young. And I was allowing him to write on the pages of my life in his words instead of mine. And then I would read them, you know, and then I would give the pen to the bullies at school. And I gave it to the teachers that put me in special ed and said, you know, you're learning disabled. You, you actually aren't as smart as the other kids in school. So we're going to put you over here because there's something wrong with you. So it was that series of giving this pen away that I think led me to the point where I had to, I had to take it back. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I, I think because the, I, truly feel, you know, the majority of people in the world live that way, right? It's a reactionary lifestyle and it's, they allow the world to, to happen to them and they're not taking life, you know, waking up with intention every day. I was just going to say, I I related to an advertising campaign, you know, like 
Nobody on the external world can influence Charlie Smith more than Charlie Smith can influence me. But if I don't have an affirming positive influence over myself, then I'm very apt to listen to whoever else is talking. And that's what happened to me. I had no, I had never given myself a voice. And so I allowed the rest of the world to narrate who I was, what I should be, what would make me happy. And I, and I kept buying into that advertising campaign, right? McDonald's does, spends a lot of money in advertising. I don't eat fast food. That's my identity. So no matter how much they spend, it really doesn't matter to me. I'm, I'm not going to go through a drive through or no matter how much the alcohol and, and beverage companies, you know, put Corona's on the beach with the frosty glass and they make it look like a fun time because of what that has effect it has on me. They can advertise all they want to me, but my influence over me as a sober man has way more power than any of those ad campaigns. I was watching the ads, listening to them, and going through the drive through and drinking the Corona. Yeah. Oh, and we, we do it too often. I can resonate in a massive way. I, I, I was no different when, you know, when prior to having my uh, awakening or my eyes opening, whatever we want to call it, right? It's, it's I had achieved everything that society said was um, we were supposed to, but wasn't happy. Right. And so we all have, and we don't all have that moment or we do when we keep going through the motions. Right. And especially if we're carrying pain and uh, things from our past that we haven't dealt with. So where do you feel that um, you had that, that moment where, you know, you said you looked in the mirror kind of enough was enough. You realized you weren't driving the ship where, where, and what steps did you start to take to, to turn that around? It's a it's a ter terrific question. It's one I've, I I I face regularly is is that that fork in the road. So it was about it was February of two thousand eight. What had happened is I had a really um, bad experience at the end of two thousand seven with drugs and alcohol. I had crossed a whole bunch of lines. I said I would never cross, and so I put down drugs and alcohol about January first of two thousand seven for about forty five days, and and. About 45 days later, I thought that 45 days had allowed me to, to drink again because I had gone so long without a drink. And, and what I didn't realize is I hadn't dealt with my past. So abstinence was one thing, but getting honest was a whole nother story. So I was still living in denial and I was still living in, in dishonesty. And I went to Hawaii on a business trip and I, and I picked up a drink. And the, over the course of the next 48 hours, I basically missed every scheduled appointment I had professionally and personally, and I came home and my family left me. And it was at that time I went to see a therapist I've been lying to for about six months. And you know what he said to me, Mike? He said, it's over. And I said, what's over? He said, it's all over, Charlie. It's all over. You're going to have to get honest. And, and, and it was, for some reason, those words, you're going to have to get honest, hit me right between the eyes because I realized in that moment I hadn't been honest since I was six years old. You know, because I grew up lying about who I was since the first day I went to elementary school and my kids said, and the kids at school said, what did you do this summer? And I said, oh, my dad took me to a ball game because that's what their dads did with them. My dad did homework with me because that's what their dads did with them. And so I realized that my whole life had been a series of dishonest associations with who I was. So when he said that to me, it was like, time to get honest. I said, that's that's going to be really hard, but I will, but I'm willing, I'm willing to try. And I started to get honest with him that very day. Wow. What kind of, what kind of weight felt like it lifted off on that day and the following days? It's, it, it's like this. I felt like at first I could look the world in the eye. Like I'd finally said, okay, I'm not who I've been presenting myself to be. It was like the shield and the armor and all of the effort that it took to hold up these, these mirrors. I was, I was kind of, or plates I was spinning. I could kind of just take a breath and say, okay, you know, what do I have to do? And, and then the work came, right? Because what it was like, Mike, was like, imagine that you're walking through life in a scrap metal yard and the huge magnet is keeping all of the pieces and shrapnel above you. And I was going through life unconsciously, avoiding all of the scrap metal. And, and, and on that day, it was like somebody hit the switch, the magnet stopped working and all the things I hadn't been dealing with in my life and all the wreckage I had caused as a result of living unconsciously just, just started to hit me. And that's where the growth comes. When you're not running from the pain and you're saying, okay, I'm going to deal with this. I'm not going to take this, drink this, buy that, watch that. I'm going to deal with this and I'm going to go through this. And on the other side of this will be a stronger, better version of Charlie Smith 
that's where all the growth came. And, and so it was relieving, as you say, and then it was really hard and, and, and hard in the sense of just confronting things that I didn't want to look at, getting honest about things I didn't want to be honest about. But then through doing that, realizing that I was going to be OK. That's beautiful. And I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up because it's it is exactly what, you know, somebody would envision if you're if you're stepping forward into your your truth, they would think you're dropping all that weight right immediately. And it's like you're free. But we know having, you know, been through it and going through it and will always go through it that, um, you know, the pain is the way and that it's as, as beautiful as these journeys are of self-exploration and stepping into your authentic self it's painful and there's a lot of suffering to, to look in the deepest, darkest parts of yourself and, and, you know, become accountable for them, frankly. Yeah, that's, I think that's the, the, the operative word. It was like just taking responsibility for my imperfections, taking responsibility for my character defects, taking responsibility for these parts of my life that are objectionable to me. And, and then, and then saying, okay, but my past isn't predictive of my future. My current behaviors are. So despite everything that's happened and everything that I've done, if I can change the things that I do starting today, I can change the things that I get. And that goes to mindset and that goes to behaviors. When I, when I, when I talk about mindset, I talk about beliefs and behaviors. You know, those are the two dials in my life that both needed to be ratcheted up. I needed to ratchet up how I, what I believed about myself and about you and about the world. And I needed to ratchet up, ratchet up the behaviors that I was engaging in. And, and then it just became like this relentless solution focus. And my, my real understanding of that became so important. Solution isn't complete resolution of an issue, right? The day I got honest, the day I put down the drink, the day I went to my first support group meeting, my life didn't get instantaneously better, but I did one thing to make it better. And that allowed me to start doing another thing to make it better. Uh, and I think that's the one thing that traps a lot of people is they think, oh, that mountain's so high, that road to fix all this is so long, you know, but but that journey of a thousand miles starts with that one step in the right direction. I've taken a lot of first steps, some of them in the wrong direction, and I kept falling further and further down the hole. But when you take that first step in the right direction, kind of three steps forward, even those one step back, you know, you feel that sense of empowerment that, okay, I can still take another step up. Absolutely. And it's amazing once you start to, to, you know, go in that direction to see how, what will happen around you. People don't realize, but you know, the universe will start to support you and these people will arise as well. And that kind of leads into one of my, my other questions, because speaking of changes is, is hard. You know, we, we know that again, but your network and the people around you, um, you know, that shifts and changes a lot when you as an individual start to change. And again, you know, on the, on, on the outside, people look at it, what a beautiful journey. They're, you know, look at all these people smiling and, and on this, you know, adventure together. But you and I know that's not how it looks on the inside. And that generally you lose a lot of people around you when you start to go through such a transformation. So how did, how did that kind of go for you? And can you chat through that a little bit? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's so many, there's so many um, great sayings in this, in this area, you know, you're, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, you know, show me your friends, I'll show you your future, your vibe attracts your tribe. And, and I think when you live in, in shadow, you know, the things that you can tolerate, the things that you accept, the things that you want to be around are, are shadow ish, because it allows you to feel a sense of connection to the world, like everyone else is doing this. So, you know, I would belong to a country club, but I would hang out with guys doing coke in the bathroom, you know, playing cards all night and drinking. Now, today, I can go to that same place and who I'm around are businessmen. I'm, I'm, I'm around loving fathers. I'm around loving parents. And they have dinner and they go home at night. So for me, it was kind of letting go of the things that didn't align with my this, the, the values and principles and the way I wanted to be living and, and allowing those things to speak for themselves. You know, they I won't say that they were a, a negative influence on me because because I'm I'm in charge of what I do, but I want to be around different people. And and when you make that intention, you make that conscious decision that I want to change my life and I want to take the next step in being around people that live this way, that value these things, that support these things. Um, it's it's amazing, and I've got a I've been, you know I've got an incredible group of friends from my past that I I 
lost when I went on my, my the dark path and, and they stayed with me. They showed me what friendship is really about, that I could not be the best version of myself and they'd still be there. I had them to go back to, let some go, and then meet a whole nother group of people that supported me on this journey because I needed a lot of support. I mean, if I were to say anything uh, as, a, as it relates to the journey I've been on, is if you want to go fast, you can go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. That this journey of life is meant to be shared with other people. That that the struggles that you have are meant to be born and shared by other people. And, and you're giving a gift by asking for help. And you're giving a gift by allowing other people to help you. And I couldn't have done any of the things that I've done on my own. This hasn't been a Charlie story. This has been a you know community story. No, that's beautiful. And I, I couldn't agree more. It's it's you know I, the part of the reason that why why I dive into men's work is because so many men are are lone wolves right we all think we can do it on our own and we want to do it on our own we're prideful beings and our egos rise up and say ah oh, watch what i can produce look how hard i can work look at all these things but you nailed it right we we burn out and when we don't have help and support we sink and there is so much magic as well in learning to receive and I'm sure that was a part of your journey too. You know, as you say, help along the way. Once we open up to that, yeah, we're 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 actually giving to the other people too because they're getting that joy out of helping and supporting. So, yeah, it's it's there's a very important message within that. Yeah, and and it continue right. So here I am. I'm 57 years old. Um, um, this past weekend, I'm um, I'm at my 35th college reunion. And I, I and I go back there sober, you know, and and I go back there as this version of me. And all of a sudden, I was overwhelmed with this insecurity that struck me. You know, a lot of the triggers of what I was like when I was a freshman came flooding back. And all of a sudden, I got really like dramatically affected by that experience. And I and 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 I was on the phone with with a buddy of mine, and he says, "Who are you talking to about this?" And so I grabbed one of my friends that was there with me and I just said, hey, can you have a second? And we talked through what I was feeling and I got reassurance and I got him to see I got to see myself through his eyes and and really learning that sharing what you're going through with somebody. And, and look, who knows if I had kept that to myself that night and the stress and the burden got too much, you know, I could have left myself susceptible to making a bad decision to deal with uncomfortable feelings. But I've learned the power of asking for help, sharing what I'm going through with someone else getting different perspective on it. And even just talking about it just takes the power out of it and allowed me to have an, an incredible rest, that rest of the night. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And there's, there's your vulnerability in that, right? You could, you could have easily, as you said, kept that to yourself and tried to deal with it, but in speaking it out loud, allowed you to release and, and walk through it and also, you know, build, build a, uh, build your friendship with, with whom was there with you. So that's yeah, wonderful. And, and, and just, you know, even on this podcast, like sharing that says I'm still imperfect, but the feelings will still come, you know, but being able to, to, to give people permission to be authentic, permission to experience their feelings. Life isn't about not feeling. Life is about feeling and then dealing with those feelings in a way that doesn't hurt yourself or anyone else growing through them. And that's, I think, one of the greatest lessons I've learned that, that's allowed me you know, to continue to evolve as a man is, you know, that, that my feelings need attention. Yes. Life is about feeling it all as much as we can, in my opinion. Right. It's to me, the, 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 the scary part is when we don't feel well said, you know, and that, 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 uh, that's when you, you look around you and you say, okay, well, what, what's important to me? And, um, why am I not getting excited for birthdays or for celebrations and all these things? And, um, you have to dig deep. So I love that. Yeah. And, and you, you also brought up, I think a really important point, you know, if you're the guy who's always doing for other people, you know, the feeling you get, if you're the man who's always doing for other people, you know, the feeling that you get when someone goes, Oh, that really made me feel good. And I really appreciate your help. And, and when you don't allow others to pour back into you. For me, it was mainly a sense of worthiness. I didn't really ever feel worthy of, of help, but I always felt elevated by helping other people. And I've flipped the narrative on that, which means I want other people to have that same feeling. I want other people to feel what I feel when, when I'm helping them. And, and if they can help me, I'm giving them the gift of, of feeling a usefulness and a purpose. And it's really allowed me not only to ask 
for more help, but to receive more help. Yes, 100%. What, and on that note, what, I mean, what, today, what fills you up? What gets, what gets Charlie excited? It's, it's a great question. And, and I was just asked, I, I do uh, mental performance training for athletes and really commercial real estate companies. And I have a client who I was just with this morning. And one of the executives that I work with was kind of like, do you miss building shopping centers? Do you miss the excitement of putting deals together and raising money and all of the things? I said, you know, here's the deal. I still develop. I just develop people and organizations. And for me, it's much more rewarding to be able to share the experiences that I've been through and see other people that are at a crossroads themselves. And, and it may not be the darkness that I was in, but it may just best be with their own sense of self or, you know, how to create the self-awareness they need or the confidence they need to face life, you know, or to deal with adversity in a different way. And so what, what fills me up today is developing people in organizations and, and pouring into others, you know, the way that I needed people to pour into me and, and then, giving everybody their, you know, giving everybody the, the pen to keep writing the stories of their lives, empowering and inspiring them to decide, you know, to be the intentional author and create the life that they want. That's what fills me up today. Amazing. I love that. And uh, sure, a heck of a lot better than, yeah, you know, being from the sales world as well, we get that, that dopamine hit when we make that big sale, or I'm sure you did on the completion of a commercial deal or when it's actually built and all of that stuff. But there's a lot more, um, you know, it's endless giving in, in the, the personal development space and to watch humans flourish and to, to be able to blossom and step into their gifts as well, uh, you know, following some wisdom from you. Yeah. And, and really it's, you know, for me, the personal development journey is, is also about, I think what you, what you and Trev find is we're also evolving ourselves. It's like, I'm not a finished product. I'm not done growing. I'm not done learning. I don't have all the answers. I learn just as much from the people that I work with or just, in, just as much after the interaction of, of giving a talk as I, as I do by being of service, it's, I learn from people. You know, I think once I stop growing, once I stop, you know, I was I kind of call it that how of, of development. It's like that honesty, that open-mindedness and that willingness, you know, those three things that allow us to continue to learn, lean into the journey and realize that we're not the sage on the stage, you know, we're, we have the ability that we're just there to learn and grow together with others. And, and that through that energy, that power of giving in a, in a collaborative way together, that we all will grow, including myself. 100%. And it's, it's, it's also, uh, I smile once in a while because it's that integrity piece, right? It's how can we be leaders in this space and how can we claim to guide others unless we're living in that way? Right. And we're constantly in search of um, how we can continue to expand and grow and not reach for more. That doesn't mean, you know, I constantly have a desire and need for more, but it's a it's a discovery process. And then it's amazing when we can share that with others. And you absolutely nailed it. It's 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 just like just like our children of this world. You know, I'll tell you, um, sure, I'm their dad. And I, I guide them in a lot, but they teach me a hell of a lot more than I teach them because I pay attention and I slow down. You know, most parents are trying to force all these 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 ways of being on them. But if we only observe them, oh, my goodness, they teach us way more. Oh, that's that's beautiful. It's, and so well said. The innocence of, of young children, you know, our brain, the developing brain, when you look at how many neurons are connected when a child is very, very young, it's like twice the amount that are there by the time they're 13 to 14. And what we do from young age of three to 13 or 14 is we start to lose connections that don't serve us. And so, you know, as a child, we've got the, the inordinate ability to absorb and to learn. And really, you know, kids teach us the innocence of falling down and getting up, taking the training wheels off the bike, scraping their knee, getting back on the bike, hopping back on the monkey bars after they got the cut across their chin. You know, they, 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 they have such innate resilience, um, you know, and they, they teach us a ton. Yes. And the, the limitless minds, right? It's, it's kid, a, a two year old wants to be an astronaut in their minds. They're going to be an astronaut, right? They want to fly to the moon. They're going to do it. It's, it's, we get told along the way continually that we can't do that or, Oh, you need to go through 15 years of school to do that. And we keep getting, you know, knock down one brick at a time when children, if we could just nourish them and continue to support that mindset. Oh my gosh, what a beautiful world we would live in today. Right. And it's, uh, it's very true. Um, 
you know, I, I, I have a what if game called what if it all goes great. You know, that's the what if game I play with. I play with even my even my adult kids, you know, apply for that job, go to nursing school. You know, what if it all goes great? What if you get, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to get the job at this hospital. There's so many people applying. Well, what if you get it? What if, you know, and, and, and we got to start playing that game. What if it all goes great? What if it goes better than I thought it would go? What if it goes right? You know, we're so apt to, 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 to buy into that negativity bias that our mind naturally has. I think that's, you know, there's nothing wrong or broken. That's the way our minds are wired for survival. And we can either think by default or we can think by design. Uh, and I think thinking by design, having a set of self-talk strategies, having a narrative and, and lyrics about our life that we want is so important. If you don't mind, I'll share a funny story about that. So my mom, you know, violently you, my mom in a violently abusive marriage for 43 years. My dad's been, been gone now for about 10 and she's been out of that marriage for, for 20 years. And she was just recently nominated the volunteer of the year for the Domestic Violence Association of America at 83 years old and was getting ready to, to accept this. Award. Yeah, amazing. Right. She's she's remarkable. And she was getting ready to go to this event and accept this this award. And she was confiding in me how nervous she was. And she says, you know, your dad always said. I was a fake and a fraud, and I kind of feel like I'm, I'm going here tonight not really worthy of, of this award. And I said, Mom, he's been gone for 10 years. You've been out for 20 years. Why are you still listening to his narrative? You know, why haven't you written your own narrative about who you are instead of who she, he thought you were? And she, I, I chuckle even saying it. She said, you mean like my Pandora? And I said, what do you mean my Pandora? She goes, well, on Pandora, if I don't like a song, I hit thumbs down and it won't play it anymore. And if I hear a song I like, I hit thumbs up. She goes, I'm going to have to go thumbs down on fake and fraud and write some new lyrics that I can give thumbs up to. I said, you know what, mom? I couldn't have said it better myself. You need to write some new lyrics, give them a thumbs up and play those as much as you've been playing fake and fraud. God bless Mama Liucci. But it was per it was perfect. Uh beautiful that's beautiful that that is like speaking of the innocence of a child almost right that is like uh the simplicity of that is is amazing that's so but mike awesome. i don't think enough of us take the pen and write those lyrics i mean really sit down and say what are the things i believe about myself let me put them to paper let that become my dominant thoughts let those bleed into my subconscious mind so i can believe them as much as I've believed all this other negative stuff people have said about me. And that's, to me, that's the power of the pen. It's the power of self-awareness and it's the power of our internal ad campaign. But you ask people, you know, what are the three things they really enjoy about themselves? Watch the pause. You ask them three things they're really struggling with or that they don't like about themselves. You know, I don't like that I'm this, I can't do this is what like, you know, it rattles off their head. I just think we need to pay more attention to being intentional about what we believe about ourselves and commit to a program of reinforcing that uh, on a regular basis, like, like Mama Liucci and give, give more thumbs up. Yes. And I love that. And speaking of, speaking of turning up the volume, I, I pulled one of your quotes actually, and it's right along these lines. So I'd love you to dive into it. Um, you had said, as a practice, we want to turn up our inner champion. And, you know, I couldn't agree more. And, but how do you, as you just said, right, our, our, our innate thought tracks are generally negative. So how do you help without giving away all your secrets? How do you generally help people kind of turn that negative chatter into that positive champion that they can, you know, uh, really guide themselves from? Well, I, I, you know, for me, as you said, and I think we talked a little bit, there, there is no I don't have I don't hold anything. Somebody said I'm going to steal that from you. You don't need to steal it. You can have it if it's going to help somebody. And, and I've said it. Use it to help somebody, because for me, that was the foundational thing that I had to learn was I can't turn down the volume on my inner critic. He's there and he's existing and he's got something to say. And the more I resisted him, the more the louder he got. So to your question, I turn up the volume on my inner champion. I have a little acronym I call ACC. First thing is to be aware, aware of the fact that you have an inner critic. Challenge it. I give it a name. Mine is Oscar, like Oscar the Grouse in Sesame Street. I recognize that it's not me. That's Oscar. And then I challenge it. Is this true? Said by who? Is it helpful? Is it kind? Does it support a healthy objective that I have for my life? Is it going to protect or preserve my life? No, no, no. 
How can I change it? And that's where I think the secret is, is actually taking the time to write what your inner champion would say to you and then write it, read it, see it, and then do it. And then actually what you're doing is you're creating neural neural pathways, you know, because your mind's like these, it's a, it's a muscle. So it's using blood and oxygen. And if you've been saying, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough. I'm not going to be able to achieve this. It's other people. If those are your words, then your mind has made those very important to you and prioritizes them, even though it doesn't feel good. So you have to become aware of your inner critic. You have to challenge your inner critic. You cannot let it run the show. You have to challenge it, label it. And then most importantly, you've got to change the lyrics that you write. And you've got to be the one who writes your inner champion lyrics, write the inner champion script. And then like an actor would memorize those lines, read them. I'm a proud, sober, independent, confident entrepreneur. You know, I mean, those are the things that I know to say to myself. And this isn't just me, Michael Phelps, you know, one one of the most winning medalists in, in Olympic history. Every time he walked through a doorway, he had something he, he would say to himself. It was his trigger, you know. So I so I like to emphasize: know what you're going to say to yourself, and know when you're going to say it. So have a have an idea of getting those mental reps in to turn up the volume on your champion. But you can't turn the volume up if you haven't written the lyrics. You know, one of my one of my good friends is a is a, is a hip hop rapper, Chino XL, and I you know I sent him the pen too, and it's like you know. Write the lyrics that you want your inner champion to say. Um, and, and that's that's my formula. That's my strategy. I love it. Yeah, it's, a, it's just kind of a version of your own mantra or your own daily affirmations that are personal to you that come from you. Yeah, and, and this will, you know, having a trauma-informed background now, you know, understanding that, you know, saying things that might create stress in you that you know aren't true, you know, I'm a multimillionaire or a billionaire, and, and it's not true. It can create some anxiety. So be really careful about the words that you use to describe yourself. Sometimes you use your name. Charlie Smith is. Sometimes I'll say, I, I bounce back quickly. I take setbacks as temporary. But have empowering things to say to yourself. Know what those are. Um, the best analogy I could live is, use, is, is Mike, is like a ship, right? If a ship is in a storm and that negativity is all around you, you need to have something to anchor you. So have some confidence conditioning statements, have some anchoring statements that you go to when that inner critic is getting loud and you shift your attention to your inner champion. All of a sudden, he becomes more powerful. Beautiful. Yeah. So you're feeding, feeding that positive giant instead of the negative one. For sure. Thousand percent, man. That's awesome. I love that. And on on your journey now, so I mean, you've you've spoken on some some pretty decent sized stages to everything from high school kids to athletes. And, and, uh, I've listened to some inspirational ones. What's the, what's your vision for your, for your journey? What's, what's kind of next for Charlie and, um, in the grand scheme of things. Well, I think the, the idea is to expand the message. So I'm about 90,000 words into the book, my life, my pen, how to own the pen to the story of your life. So, um, you know, I want to turn that into a, I want to turn that into a course. I want to turn that into a, to a journal. I want to allow others to be able to buy the pen to the story of their life. And I want to continue to help my peers in, in the corporate world, you know, understand the power of mental performance training and mental conditioning and, and getting them to, to learn, you know, that strategy and those tactics to, to continue to improve, not what they're doing, but how they feel about themselves and the way that they're doing it. Um, and so for me, it's, it's, just leaning into going where I'm called. You know, I, 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 I just say I go where I'm needed until I'm needed where I go. And I'll, I'll, I've spoken to high school dance teams and I've spoken to Division One college athletes, Fortune 300 companies, you know, and, and I was just at, a, at, a, at an event and a guy said, hey, will you come to Rikers Island with me in, in September and speak? And so the answer is yes. You know, uh, I, I will go because I, I want to help people meet the meet the, the best version of them. You know, and that's the, the journey I'm on is, is just to continue to empower people to become the best version of themselves and, and to do that by owning the pen. I love that. It sounds to me like the, uh, the surrender experiment by Michael Singer, just the flow, right? Getting into and owning your craft and, and where the universe is guiding you, you're going to go and, and, and deliver. So that's beautiful. Yeah, it's my new, I have it on a sticky, I'm, you know, I've got to upgrade my background here a little bit, but I can't get rid of it because this is my mantra these days. 
Yes. So we, we all think we need to get somewhere. We all think we should be going faster. I just have to keep reminding the world that here is on the way there and don't miss here, you know, because these precious moments we have on a day in day about that, those three breaths we took at, at the beginning of this podcast to just be where our feet are, to be in this present moment, to keep things in that next 200 feet. You know, if I put a uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico on my GPS on my phone, it's going to show me this really long trip I'm going to have to go on. But when I hit go, it says out the driveway, turn left, turn, turn right. You know, it's just that next 200 feet. And I think that's kind of where I try to keep my perspective. No, it's beautiful. I love it. There's a, there's a Gandhi quote about that. And I can't, I can't think of it. I was just trying to have a quick peek, but it's, you know, about why, um, the, the, the present time is called the present, right? Cause yeah, it's a gift say, to yeah, us. But, yeah, that's right. It's a gift. It's a gift. You know, the, the, the past is, is, is already happened. The future, when the future comes, it'll be the present. And, and right here, right now is, is a gift. Thank you. That's yeah. It's right along those lines. Yes. Yeah. It's, and it it's, is so true. We all are constantly, you know, planning for our futures and, and reaching for what's next and striving for more. But man, oh man, there's so much power when we learn to to slow down and 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 be present, you know, in all parts of our lives, in all conversations, in with ourselves, most importantly. And in fact, we actually speed up when we do that because we gain clarity and creativity and all those beautiful things. Well, well said. And, and it, it, I think, you know, uh, George Mumford, who's a, a close, we talk about the universe bringing amazing people to you since, since I started this journey in 2016, I met George for the first time and, and we've become really close, really close friends. And, you know, having a practice of being in the present moment, having things that we can do, whether it be a, whether it be our breath, a mindfulness practice, you know, a body scan, you know, there's, there's lots of, things that we can do to gain, you know, even eating your food, you know, or brushing your teeth. These are all areas for you to connect with yourself and to be in the present moment and to realize that the idea of mindfulness isn't about quieting your mind and having it not think. It's about directing your thinking and about thinking of on purpose in the present moment without judgment. And, you know, I never thought about training my mind, about training that there was a way to actually get myself to think by design instead of by default. And so, you know, that practice of mindfulness, of, of awareness, of breath, of taking a breath, you know, of being where my feet are, they've allowed me to reduce my anxiety and reduce my feelings of overwhelm and, and then bring expectations, you know, way back to just what's the next right thing to do. Intentionality right? You're not being pushed and shoved in these different directions without control, but you're owning that. And it's, you know, you're allowing and making the decisions of where you want to go and how you're going to feel and what you're going to think. And, and, and I just, you know, my, my, and I, I'm so appreciative of, like I said, the work you and Trev do in this, in this area of being extremely conscious and, and inspiring and empowering people that look, if I can, I mean, I come from Scarborough, Maine, you know, and, and, and my path to this point has not been easy. You know, no one's, no one's given me anything. And if I can overcome these things, you can too, even if they're not as dramatic or traumatic as what I've been through, you know, whatever it is you're struggling with, there is a solution. There is always a solution. Uh, and sometimes it just takes that, that quiet space in between what's going on and where you want to go to just reflect and ask the right questions and, and start taking steps forward. Yes. And along those lines, I'd love to dive into one more topic with you before I go to what I call my final two questions. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what I'm, I'm big on habits and in the space we work, I love habits. Uh, we have a habit tracker. I do it daily. Um, so what supports Char Charlie? What are some of your non-negotiables uh, that, you know, your, your daily habits that support you in your journey? It's a great question. I use uh, I use Habit Share. I've been using it for a while. They they say you're born looking like your mother and father, and you die looking like your decisions and your choices. And so our habits become a you know a, a reflection of of who we become. So for me, there's a, a few non negotiables. The the first thing I learned is to is is to not hit the snooze button in the morning. So I keep the first promise I make to myself by getting up. Um, I pray and and meditate to start my day. Uh, and I always pray and reflect at the end of the day. Um, 
the, the other non-negotiable for me is my connection with, with a higher power. Um, so for me, it's the whole person. It's, it's emotional. It's physical. So physical exercise. I, I, I used to be about 245 pounds. I'm 5'10". So I was, a, I was, you know, Charlie Brown's great pumpkin for a while. Um, but, you know, I, I believe, I believe my, my physicality changes my psychology. Uh, and so, you know, I exercise six days a week. Um, mostly seven, but my non-negotiable is, is to get physical exercise six days a week. So I have a physical connection, have a spiritual connection, uh, have a, have, and have an emotional connection. Um, those are part of my non-negotiables and I, and I track them. You know, I think what's, what measure gets measured mattered. So my, you know, everything from my morning prayers, my night prayers, my gratitude list, you know, those are all things that, that I track because I know what the best version of me looks like. And, and sometimes there's red X's there. You know, I, I, I miss a day. And I think back to Michael Phelps, he, his, his advice was always don't put two bad days together, you know, get back up on, on the bike as fast as you can and build that habit. But um, I think to, to, to close on that, my routine is, is personal. I think the most important thing is to have a routine, have some non-negotiables. And it comes from knowing what it's like to be at your best, right? We already know we've, we've all had success. You've already been at your best or a version of your best. What were you doing when you were at your best? So many times I work with people that, that aren't there now. And I'll say, what was it like to be at your best? What are you doing now? I stopped doing that. I stopped doing this. I stopped doing this. So we can become complacent. So I think it's important to have a routine, morning routine, an, a PM routine, and to have the things that you know allow you to be at your best, whether it's spiritual, physical, you know, or emotional. Yes. Without, you know, without that tracking, I think it's, it is a different ball game. It's the beautiful part about it is, as you said, if, if there's a day or a few days or a week where you're feeling out of alignment, you can, you can track backwards and you can say, okay, I haven't been sitting and meditating for four days. I didn't get to the gym for, you know, five of seven days last week. I didn't write. And you can start to go backwards and we have an equation either way. Right. And so, so that's true. what I think is so powerful on this journey. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, every, like I said, everybody know there's, you can read books and you can find out what the best in, 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 in class do in all these areas. My, my friend, Sean Casey, who, who played major league baseball for 13 years, career 302 hitter, amazing guy. I said to him, you know, Sean, success leaves clues. He said, so does disaster. I said, you're right. You're right. <laughs> you know, so follow the right clues. Yes. That's an important one. Yeah. Amazing, brother. Well, I have, listen, I have, um, I know we're getting to the top of the hour here and I have two questions that I ask all the guests that come on this show and I would love your insight. Um, Because this is called the Conscious Creator Podcast, I would love to hear in your own words um, how you define what a conscious creator is and how it relates to your life. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think for me, uh, being a conscious creator means being aware of the gifts that make you unique to being who you are, and then having the willingness and the vulnerability to one, live those gifts and to share them with other people. Mm, I love that. Thank you. And the second one is, if you could give your younger self, one piece of advice with the wisdom that you have today, what would that be? Wow. I have a lot to say. I have a lot to say to that kid. And and what I would tell him is it it, it all works out just fine, kid. Don't ever give up. Mm -hmm. Don't ever give up on you. It all works out just fine. Amazing. Yeah. You know, you know, there's, it's easy to it's easy to go back and offer advice of of things that might change the trajectory of my life but the truth is all of those things made me who I am today and I can pass that look in the mirror test today you know I I like the man I see looking back at me even though he's flawed even though he still has imperfections even though he has struggles in his life I like the way he deals with them I like how honest he is about him and if that all made me this version of me, man, I say, dude, you're going to go through a lot, but it all work out. Okay. You'll be all right. You know? Yes. 
Yeah, it's beautiful. That's it. We couldn't be where we are without, you know, the journey and it, all the bumps along the way. So I appreciate that sentiment. And, and uh, you know, if we could only speak to our younger selves, and but we can speak to the, the you know, the, our younger generation. And I know that's what you do often. And that's why I have so much respect for that, because I think it's so, so important. You know, we can get so lost in, in uh, that late high school age as we make those big next steps and try to decide what we're going to do for the rest of our lives. Right. It's uh, it's so yeah. important to have that, that, that amazing mentorship and guidance along the way um, to, to, to tell us it's okay to fumble and okay to not know what we want to do and all those things that, you know, we had the stressors of and are still there today. Yeah. It's, it, you know, I think kids are, are given this impression that they need to figure it out. I mean, when you said that, it just feels so overwhelming, right? What are you going to do for the rest of your life? I'm 57. I'm still figuring it out, kid. You know, but it's, it's how you, it's how you live that'll allow you to figure it out because that old adage, failure isn't an option, right? You sometimes hear that. It's like, tell Oprah that, tell Walt Disney that, you know, tell Abe Lincoln that. I mean, these are people that failed over and over and over again. Tell Michael Jordan that failure is not only an option, it's necessary, kid way yeah well amazing brother i really really appreciate our chat today and i know you're a very busy man and so i appreciate you you know lending the time and i'm so grateful for our connection and um and what we're going to do from here because i know there's collaborations ahead and you know that we're both on a genuine journey to support each other and um, it's just been a blessing to, to get to know you. So before I let you go, please, you know, share anything that you have going on, um, how we, how people can, can keep up with, with Charlie Smith and, and where he's at next and, um, you know, how they can experience your greatness. Yeah. I'm primarily on Instagram and Facebook at Charlie Smith speaks or Charlie Smith. My, my website is Charlie I'll offer any listeners that want to shoot me an email that want the pen, I, I will send you the pen to write the story of your life. Um, I want everyone that wants it to have it. Um, and, and that's primarily where, where they can, uh, where they can find me. Well, thank you, brother. So much love and appreciation for you. It's been, it's been a great chat and I look forward yeah, to give Trev, my, give Trev my best and, and thank you guys for all you do. Absolutely. We'll do. If today's episode resonated with you in any way, or you feel it added value to your day, Please, please, please feel free to share it with friends. And of course, link and subscribe so that you can be alerted for future episodes. We sincerely appreciate you watching and always remember to learn, laugh, and love. Until next time.